artwork during the early days of our American colonial period mainly consists of portraits, as settlers desired to create their own identities in a brand new world. Portraits are painted upon commission, frequently on the occasions of birth, engagement, marriage, death, and other joinings or separations. And very quickly, artists are in demand. Even Lapowinso, one of the famous Lenape Indian chiefs, has his own likeness painted on canvas. Lapowinso signed the infamous 1737 Pennsylvania Walking Purchase, and for all his days he remained sad that his people were cheated out of their land. Portraits are often substitutes for an absent loved one, therefore weighted with great meaning, telling us how early colonists respond socially to joy and bereavement, as well as raising questions regarding the personal bonds between the beholder and the sitter. The colonial elite also looked to these early paintings as an art form, embodying the ambitious ideals and taste of a wealthy society. Large portraits are meant to be displayed on colonial walls for all to see. In many examples, even the family dog is included in a joyful commemoration. <laughs> Two vertical red bands on either side of a central black band, decorated with three silver crosses, make up a shield emblem for the settlement of New York, then called New Amsterdam. European style dictates that lions be part of this emblem, but instead two angry beavers flank the shield, therefore adding a unique American touch. Well aware of a prosperous New York, the East Jersey proprietors proposed settling a new port city, soon to be called Perth Amboy. Upon our view and survey of Amboy Point, we find it extraordinarily well situated for a great town or city, beyond expectation. The point is a good, lively land, 10, some places 20 feet above the watermark. We are now building some small houses, fitting to entertain workmen and such, who will go and build larger. The stones lie exceedingly well and good up the Routon River, a tide's passage, and oyster shells upon the point to make lime with all, which will wonderfully accommodate us in building good houses cheap, warm for winter and cool for summer. Thomas Rudyard, Deputy Governor at Amboy Point, May 30th, 1683. John Watson ventures across the Atlantic Ocean to the Newport city of Perth Amboy. As a man in his late twenties, Watson desires to start a new life in this colonial capital, arriving prior to 1715. Here's John Watson in Perth Amboy. Throughout his days, Watson retains this notebook containing an ostrich drawn by him at age 16, penned adjacent to his childhood arithmetic lesson. Promptly, colonial governors and the elite gentry of the American colonies commission Watson's talent. An elegant blue gown is captured on canvas by Watson, as worn by Mrs. Killian Van Rensselaer. As the matron of the manor of Rensselaerwick, her portrait is displayed for all society to see. Watson's origin is near Dumfries, Scotland, born 1685. In his youth, he is a shepherd. Later, after learning the trade of sign painting, he begins painting portraits. Legend states, while in Scotland, Watson falls in love with a young woman. 
At the end of a courtship, Watson is jilted by the woman for young Scott Piper. Watson seeks refuge in the American colonies, vowing that he would never seek the hand of a woman in marriage. And he never did. Amboy is a small town. Tis a seaport having a good harbor. They have the best oysters I have ate in America. It is a very old American city, and here frequently the Supreme Court and Assembly sit. It is the principal town in New Jersey. It lies close upon the water, and the best houses in town are ranged along the water side. Dr. Alexander Hamilton, 1744. Demand for the best, including fine furniture and art, grows among the wealthy gentry within this colonial capital. And likewise, Watson's own fortune expands. At the Long Ferry Tavern on Lower High Street, Watson probably engages in business dealings while enjoying some of the newest fairs. There remains no doubt that Watson fixes upon this city as the place of his sojourn, buying land and building houses. On the shores of the broad bay formed by the Arthur Kill and the Raritan River, John Watson acquires land, once owned by Benjamin Clark, an early settler, and therein Watson makes Perth Amboy his home with an adjoining art gallery. As his reputation blossoms, the Parker Castle, as well as other fine homes, receive John Watson. Even his own art studio is a conversation piece during colonial times. This writer remembers well the child's wonder that was caused in his early life by the appearance of the house Watson owned. A smaller building which adjoined it, and which had been his painting and picture house, remained and attracted admiration at the heads of sages, heroes, and kings. The window shutters were divided into squares, and each square presented the head of a man or woman, which, if memory can be trusted, represented personages in antique costume, and the men with beards and helmets or crowns. Old Mr. Watson painted many portraits and lent his money to those who employed him, thus patronizing his patrons. William Dunlap, History of the Rise and Progress of the Arts of Design, 1834. Aaron Schuyler commissions Watson to paint his portrait in 1725. It is oil on linen and is over four feet in height, and may have been completed at Watson's Perth Amboy estate. Four decades ago, an archaeological excavation was conducted on the Watson site, with thousands of colonial artifacts being discovered, some dating to the Watson era, and other artifacts dating to an even earlier settler on that land, Benjamin Clark. And only now, in recent times, is the evidence coming to both public and professional perspective. So Benjamin Clark, the first fellow who owned the property, he was a bookseller, but he was also selling all sorts of things out of his house. And he was trading with Native Americans, even at a property in Piscataway where he was doing some trading. So some of the things that would have been traded to Native Americans are interesting. Native Americans were interested in things like scissors and in musical instruments. Now it's not in great shape, but remember, this is roughly 300 years old. So here's a scissor, and it looks like the sort of scissor one of us might have used in elementary school. So imagine Clark trading this to Native Americans so that they could cut up perhaps hides or cloth, or perhaps it's a little bit later. We can't tell exactly. Maybe it was used by John Watson to trim canvases in his studio. An extraordinary find in really tremendous preservation. Musical instruments. These are very simple, but these are musical instruments too. These are mouth harps, played by holding against the mouth with a metal reed. The reeds are now gone and they would have been twanged, making 
making sounds very popular for trade with Native Americans. We have two of them from the Clark Watson site, missing only their reeds so they can't make sound any longer, but they can remind us that the world these people lived in was filled with sounds and interesting things, a very different world than the world we inhabit today. Some of the artifacts found at the Clark Watson house speak to consuming food. This is a pewter spoon and it's in rough shape, but pewter degrades very quickly in the soil. So it's amazing that it's intact at all. I mean, a very broad spoon. So imagine eating soup with it. Spoons like this have been found at other colonial sites from the late 1600s and early 1700s, and they appear to have been very popular trade items with Native Americans. They probably replaced wooden spoons or maybe spoons made out of horn. We also have some bone handled cutlery, very careful carving on it. And it would have had a, a metal blade, much of which has rusted away, but the bone handle is still intact. So imagine setting a fine table with a spoon and a knife. Forks were actually quite uncommon. So knives and spoons were more common during this time period. But again, someone eating their meal here in Perth Amboy, overlooking the waterfront in the early 1700s, quite a picture of the past. John Watson calls his drawings black and whites, such as this one of Governor William Burnett. 1725 is a good estimated date of this particular black and white. It's less than four inches in height, sketched in black ink and washed in graphite with glazing on vellum. Burnett is governor of both New York and New Jersey, and later Massachusetts. From 1702 until 1738, the colonies of New York and New Jersey are united under just one governor. Elizabeth Schuyler is smiling, yet she is dressed in a mourning outfit, sometimes called Widow's Weeds. According to historical records, her spouse, Captain Johannes Schuyler, is alive throughout Elizabeth's lifetime. And within this painting, Watson poses him dressed in the finest 18th century garb. Definitely a contrast from Elizabeth. Does Watson paint both at the same time? Captain Schuyler is almost 10 years younger than his wife and outlives her by the same number of years. So he might know her secret, but we do not. The East Jersey proprietors are the wealthy landowners within their colony. Perth Amboy is their capital city. Real estate is a driving economic force, and the property deeds are stored in this high street office. Watson begins to acquire property from them and others at Perth Amboy as early as 1726, for in that year he's a grantee of 50 acres of land. By investing his art commissions in real estate from Perth Amboy up to New York City, as well as building dwellings, John Watson's fortunes rapidly expand. Mr. Watson never was married, and having no children, he prevailed upon several relatives to leave Scotland and settle in Perth Amboy. He had a nephew who was a midshipman in the British Navy, but even that eligible home was abandoned on the promise of inheriting his uncle's wealth. Mr. Alexander Watson, the son of the painter's brother, accordingly became a resident with his uncle and superintended his business. William Dunlap, 1834.
The creases in this colonial jacket are stylistically typical of John Watson. Several short lines appear in a light gold color, and one continuous zigzag line completes the creasing effect. At the opening of the coat, thinner continuous long lines, which are lighter than a deep gold fabric, run up the jacket, and the buttons remain unique and interesting. These brush strokes date to 1730 and portray Stephen Van Rensselaer, Stephen's face being not quite one chord to the left with his eyes straight forward, a characteristic Watson pose, which also exists in Watson's black and whites. Black and whites vary, some are in pencil and wash. Wash is where a brush is dipped in ink, while others are in plumbago, meaning graphite is used on vellum. Watson's oil portraits are painted on canvas. They are hung on museum walls or in archive vaults. But still, a few portraits remain in stately mansions to this very day, and Tessie Henderson, along with her children, graces the walls of a New York Federalist manor. In Watts' 1726 account book, he mentions three pictures for the Hendersons. It's likely that through similar interest, Henderson and Watson become acquainted and the portraits are commissioned. Watson lends his money to those who employ him, thus procuring employment from those who could give payment, or in simple terms, patronizing his patrons. Going up this Federalist Mansion's grand center hall staircase, we note the elegance of a different day and time. And near the top of the stairs, we see Watson's portrait of Dr. Henderson and two of his daughters. The children have been restored from two shadow images that appear to have been covered over by the original artist soon after they were painted. So far, art historians are able to identify only nine John Watson oil paintings, along with a catalog of 26 black and whites. We know that during Watson's long 83-year lifespan, he painted and drew many more works. Where are they? What happened to these Watson productions? There are possibly others in museum vaults, as well as in private collections that remain unidentified. Unlike modern artists, John Watson did not sign most of his art, and so historians must use colonial documents to locate these portraits, along with these stylistic poses and brush strokes that we have just seen. It was widely known by anyone who knew anything about Perth Amboy history that uh, John Watson lived and worked um, on this particular site across from Bayview Park, Water Street, south, the southwest corner of Water and Market Streets. This is one of the earliest sites in Perth Amboy because it was developed originally uh, in 1683-84 by Benjamin Clark, one of the first settlers who was a stationer from London, a Quaker, and he came to Perth Amboy in search of religious freedom, but he was involved with the proprietors. He printed some of their early tracks. He opened up a shop there, station shop of books, so it's, it's the forerunner of the Perth Amboy Business District, if you will, and he uh, lived there. And we know that Watson eventually occupied this house because he bought it in two separate halves. First, in seven, he bought half of it in 1737, and then the other half in 1742. So we looked at some of the old maps, and we they weren't very accurate, but of course, from that time frame, but we had an idea of where this house was located. And so we selected a, a spot to start digging. Um, we got the, it was available to us because the owner uh, of the property had it up for sale. It was purchased right at this time by a new owner who wasn't sure what he was gonna do with it. And uh, we figured that he might end up demolishing and redeveloping the site and we would have no opportunity to investigate after that. So we saw the opportunity and took it. And uh, we just selected a spot to dig, and when we did dig there, uh, the very first shovelful contained artifacts of the time frame we're talking about. This is a beautiful, also reconstructed, mug made out of Staffordshire, or what we sometimes call buff-bodied English earthenware. And it has a nice slip on it and this sort of banded brown decoration. It's in very good shape. 
Again, these are sort of museum quality finds that Bill was making right here in Perth Amboy at the Clark Watson site. And this could have been used for alcoholic beverages or, or more likely for tea or perhaps even coffee. Coffee wasn't that common, but tea certainly was. There had been a tavern that was operated at the site. Now this is between Clark's occupation and the later occupation of John Watson. This is in the very early 18th century. And this is the base of a glass onion bottle excavated from the site. This is probably the thickest piece of glass on the bottle and it's patinated. So we see the glass sort of decaying and it's got this interesting iridescent color, but it dates from about 1680 to about 1710, uh, right when the site was at its height in terms of its use as a tavern. And then finally, here is a nice piece of a stoneware mug, the handle still intact, with a little bit of blue cobalt banding. And this might have been made in Germany, though similar pieces were made here in North America, not very far from Perth Amboy in Cheesequake or South Amboy area. And then one more artifact to end the ensemble, another piece of buff bodied Staffordshire. It's got this nice sort of dot decoration, very common, but a very flat flat rim here. And this is probably a piece of a chamber pot. Now, a lot of folks might not know what a chamber pot is, but this is, this is sort of the equivalent of a modern day porta potty in the sense that someone could use a pot like this to relieve themselves if they don't want to go out to the outhouse in the middle of the winter or go out to the privy in the middle of the winter. And of course, this vessel would have been quite useful uh, having perhaps imbibed something from those mugs that we saw, saw earlier. It's also easy to date the ceramics. This is something that would have been made between about 1670 and, and about the time of the American Revolution. So it dates the site very, very nicely. John Watson is familiar with Perth Amboy's waterfront docks, as well as the Parker Castle, shown in the center of this watercolor. Prior to 1732, Watson sketches John Parker, who is a member of the Governor's Council. As the capital seat of government, Perth Amboy's wealth expands along with the elite gentry of that time. The commanding and beautiful point on which the settlers and proprietors of New Jersey fixed for the site of their capital has a fine harbor designed by nature for the great commercial metropolis of the Middle Colonies. William Dunlap, 1834. Colonial currency is signed in Perth Amboy and printed in Woodbridge by James Parker. In just one day alone in 1755, a vast colonial fortune of 15,000 English pounds of currency is authorized and printed. New Jersey paper money is issued to pay military troops, as well as for loan purposes through provincial offices. Andrew Johnston is the treasurer of the East Jersey province and the president of the Board of Proprietors. Johnston builds this home on High Street in Perth Amboy and therein transacts the financial business of the colony, which quickly develops a good reputation. Within this environment, John Watson not only flourishes as a painter, but also becomes a merchant, a dealer in real estate transactions, and a moneylender. Watson buys, sells, and rents real estate, and is considered a large operator therein. As early as 1719, Watson's own notebook indicates large sums of money due him. Only five years after his arrival in New Jersey, Watson has already accumulated considerable property, including 191 acres in Perth Amboy. Watson adds to this land 371 apple trees, a pair of oxen, six cows, two horses, plows, and additional equipment. All transactions are officially recorded, and stamped wax seals are used to formally execute these contracts. At nine in the morning, we stopped at the sign of the King's Arms Tavern in Amboy, where I breakfasted. As I sat in the porch, I observed an antique figure pass by, having an old plaid banyan, a pair of thick worsted stockings ungartered, a greasy worsted nightcap, and no hat. You see that original, said the landlord. 
He is an old bachelor, and it is his humor to walk the street always in that dress. Though he makes but a pitiful appearance, yet he is proprietor of most of the houses in town. He is very rich, but for all that has no servant but milks his own cow, dresses his own victuals, and feeds his own poultry himself. Dr. Alexander Hamilton, 1744 Dr. Hamilton's diary refers to a frugal John Watson, who was a little over 60 years old when Hamilton saw him. Not antique by modern standards, but obviously, a successful Watson did not adhere to the dress codes or elite protocols of that day. Watson simply did as he pleased, a free spirit, and that, in and of itself, is noteworthy. By 1762, the building of the proprietary house commences, in an effort by the proprietors to attract a royal colonial governor to their hometown. Within this environment, Watson becomes an American success story, evolving from a poor immigrant to one of the wealthiest men in this capital city. Here, at the Parker Castle, Watson sketches at least one family member. Like the Parker family, Watson is also involved in merchant trade. Goods bought at the point. Stockings, cloth, linings, muslin, boys' hats. May 10th, John Hendrick, calico and buttons. William Dayworthy and Effenham Townley, knives and forks. John Watson, accounts at Amboy Point, 1726. John Watson lives and works here, high on the Perth Amboy Bluff, near the corner of Water and Market Streets. His art gallery is also on this property. Watson's window shutters are adorned with the painted images of sages, heroes, and kings. Among the first of its kind in the colonies is Watson's art gallery. In latter years, the Raritan Bay Seminary is constructed on the Watson site, directly opposite from the modern Bayview Park. Right across Market Street on the other corner, in Watson's old neighborhood, is the Raritan House a grand colonial home with a splendid view of the Raritan Bay. Years later, during the mid-19th century, a fire occurs, but this home is rebuilt with an added third story. Just imagine the discussions of art, business, and politics in this old neighborhood over the centuries. Everyone is eager for news. Information is typically disseminated by newspapers, letters, or word of mouth. A hot topic of political talk is Lord Cornbury, the royal colonial governor. During that day, this portrait is rumored to be of Cornbury in a fine lady's dress. True or not, it highlights the political use of artwork and is definitely a focal point of tavern gossip and jokes throughout the colony of New Jersey. John Watson accumulates capital. In lieu of just locking it up in his strong box, Watson becomes a moneylender on security, just like a private banker. Watson loans the excess of his revenue to those who want it, requiring asset security such as deeded land. In 1760, this deed is conveyed from Thomas Skinner to John Watson. 
Watson will amass an even greater fortune by loaning out money, as well as buying property during troubled times, with this deed being part of his wealth. Everything here is done legally by Cortland Skinner, a colonial attorney witnessed by Andrew Robinson, as well as Watson's nephew, Alexander. Everything here is in the greatest confusion, and the first of November dreaded. The laws of trade had ruined the merchants and drained the colonies of their silver. Little was left after paying the duties to pay their debts in England. Without money, no clothing can be got, and woolen must be had in this climate. Discontent was painted in every man's face, and the distress of the people very great from an amazing scarcity of money. Cortland Skinner, 1755 in contrast to most, even in hard times, John Watson has money and is willing to loan it out, perhaps making him a most valuable asset in the colony of New Jersey. The collection of artifacts from the Clark Watson site is really exceptional. But there are some things in the collection that are truly extraordinary, that are unparalleled in North American archaeology. And I want to show you two of these artifacts. Now, the first is a very curious find. Here it is. It's been conserved. It looks like a little bit of metal. Kind of curious. It's bent. It's got a nail or what's left of a nail through it. Not in great shape. What we think this is, and it was conserved by folks at Colonial Williamsburg, what we think this is, is a picture hook. In a sense, a safety picture hook. So one could use this to hang a picture on the wall of a house. Imagine nailing this into the plaster on the wall, and then the picture frame would go over this lip here and it would be safely affixed to the wall. It would also make it a little bit hard for someone to remove it or to knock it down unwittingly. This is the only picture hanger that has ever been found, so far as we know, in North America. And it makes sense, of course, because it's coming from the home of John Watson, an extraordinary artist. And his home was not just a home, but it was also his studio and his gallery. It was lavishly decorated. So this is a fantastic find that speaks to the house's importance in the history of American art. But there's more. He found pieces of cloth. Now, typically as archeologists, we don't find pieces of cloth, right? They've decayed long ago. But these were in an archeological deposit, perhaps because there was a lot of shell there where the pH was balanced just right and they had not decayed. The other thing that's extraordinary about this is there's some sort of, it looks like an encrustation on the cloth, but that's, that's not really an encrustation. What we're looking at is a piece of an artist's canvas from the mid 18th century. And that gray encrustation, that in fact is the lead paint that would have been used to decorate the canvas. Now, art historians and conservators have looked at this piece, and it's been looked at using a particular type of x ray, a portable x ray that allows us to determine the chemical composition of artifacts. So this is in fact a painting. We can say that based on the chemical composition. The other thing that's interesting about it is when a conservator looked at it, he identified the canvas as a Flemish canvas from the 18th century. So it's in fact an artist canvas. And he said it was a prepared canvas. So this tells us a little bit about what John Watson's doing. He's buying prepared canvases made in Europe, bringing them here, and then he's painting the portraits, typically, of individuals on those canvases, famous individuals, like Lewis Morris, New Jersey's colonial governor. Now, this particular canvas, obviously it's been buried for over two centuries, but it also, it's damaged, and it was damaged before it was buried. It has a series of slash marks across it. And this is only a small fragment of a much larger canvas. And that raises interesting questions as to what happened here. Why are there these slash marks? 
Watson's. And we know that Watson's house was vandalized by American soldiers during the revolution. He had passed away, but the house may still have had paintings in it when it was occupied by American troops and vandalized. And one wonders, of course, this is speculative, but one wonders if troops or someone else slashed at a painting, perhaps a painting showing a king or another royal figure during the 18th century. We'll never know for sure, but we do know that this is one of John Watson's paintings, the subject of which is now invisible to us, but which speaks to a time when great art was being prepared right here in Perth Amboy. John Watson lives up to the ripe old age of 83. He dies and is buried in Perth Amboy at St. Peter's Cemetery. On his deathbed, Watson leaves these words of advice to his nephew, Alexander. Never forget your loving and dear uncle, John Watson, who left you his blessing with his estate. Be a frugal, honest, upright, sober man. Shine, shine in the world. Never, never get in debt if possible and be frugal in your family, and never load yourself with too much company. Be not encumbered with too many servants, more than you want. I have nothing further to say, but God bless you. I can't stay long with you. Adieu. John Watson, 1768. Watson died on August 22nd of that same year, and this is his tombstone. He never married and leaves money to members of his family. But the bulk of his fortune goes to Alexander Watson, who attended the old man's business affairs during the last years of his life. Towards the end, John Watson becomes blind, deaf, and bedridden. Watson was rich but kept no servants and dressed plainly, and hence was an object for gossip during a time of a strict English class system. Yet we know he was a prudent man who lived without ostentation or superfluous expense. And so, John Watson spends eternity within a block of where he worked and lived. To this very day, the site near his studio commands a graceful view where the Raritan River and the Arthur Kill intersect. Here, John Watson's home and art gallery once stood. The site has served many purposes. At one time, there was a colonial tavern here, and even earlier, it was the homestead of Benjamin Clark, one of Perth Amboy's earliest settlers. Prior to and during the Revolutionary War, those loyal to the King of England are persecuted by American patriots. Tories are tarred and feathered, beaten, and openly ridiculed. Alexander Watson is a loyalist, flees Perth Amboy during 1776 and dies in New York. Eventually, the vast property holdings are confiscated by the new American government. And so, along with other Tory families, John Watson's huge family fortune is now gone. Violence and fear become commonplace. Perth Amboy becomes a garrison town during the Revolutionary War. The old barracks dating to the French and Indian War are occupied by American Patriot troops, and later British. But what happened to Watson's art gallery and all of his paintings? In 1776, the rebels, a motley mass of half-armed militia under General Mercer, made a show of opposition to the regulars of Britain, 
who were divided from them by the waters of Arthur Kill Sound. Of course, the deserted house and collection of paintings were left at the mercy of the undisciplined yeomanry, and this first cabinet of the fine arts was broken up, and the treasures dispersed by those who probably took delight in executing summary justice on the effigies of the Nimrods of the Fatherland. William Dunlap, 1834. Yet, despite the ravages of war and the decay by time, we remain fortunate that many of Watson's works have survived. David Lyle, East Jersey proprietor and goldsmith. Stephen Van Rensselaer, 7th Patroon, Rensselaer Manor. Maria Van Cortland Van Rensselaer, wife of Killian, 3rd Lord of the Rensselaer Manor. Daniel Hendrickson, farmer and preacher. Sir William and Lady Anne Keith, fourth baronet of Nova Scotia, Delaware and Pennsylvania governor, and his wife. Arendt Schuyler, businessman. William Livingston, future Revolutionary War general and first New Jersey state governor. Lewis Morris, New Jersey Royal Governor. Dr. James Henderson, New York physician and merchant. Tessie Benson Henderson and her children, wife of James. William Burnett, Royal Governor of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. Captain Johannes and Elizabeth Schuyler, Mayor of Albany and his spouse. Anne Van Rensselaer, Gentry. Jacobus Van Rensselaer, 4th Patroon and 2nd Lord Rensselaer Manor. Jan Baptiste Van Rensselaer, brother of Jacobus. Edward Collins, Gentry. Name unknown, a gentleman of the Schuyler family. Gabrielle Stelly, ferry owner and businessman. William Iyer, brewer and first mayor of Perth Amboy. Sophia Watson, niece of and caregiver to John Watson. John Watson, self-portrait. Most of the people portrayed here are the elite gentry of the New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania colonies. They have the money, as well as the connections to hire the best artists of their day and time. And that choice is Perth Amboy's John Watson. 